Call K on BBC Radio Scotland. Mervyn King's money boost for the economy means lower interest rates for savers. Are you a saver who feels shafted? 0500 92 95 00. And is looking after your teeth costing you an arm and a leg? The Office of Fair Trading says dental work in Britain is costly and confusing. What's it like in your neck of the woods? 0500 92 95 00. Call K. Now. Good morning to you. That was four body parts that I managed to get into that little link. Did you notice that? Your teeth, an arm, a leg and your neck. I don't know, it's these weird little things that just seem to please me. But maybe that's just because it's a Friday. Uh, Friday the 7th of October and parts of the country have had snow. I don't believe it. Well, it's true, obviously. I've seen the pictures in the paper. If you can see the white stuff from where you are now, give me a call. 0500 92 95 00. I want to hear you crunching your boots on it because I mean who knows those pictures could be fake we need evidence and is this the earliest that we've seen snow the 7th of October it's got to be close hasn't it yes let me know if you've seen it before the 7th of October Um, we're going to be talking about the cost of dental care a bit later on the office of fair trading says that we pay a lot in Britain compared to other European countries uh, both private and NHS care and that people often don't know exactly what they're being charged for well and you don't do you I mean you don't say to the dentist and could you please tell me how much that filling is well you can't talk for a start can you I mean you can't do that it is Friday let me know if you think your perfect smile is costing too much does the cost of putting of going to the dentist put you off going in the first place which of course we don't want 0500 92 95 00 you can text me on 80295 or email call k at bbc.co.uk um, right the governor of the Bank of England Mervyn King tells us that we are in the grip of potentially the worst financial crisis ever which is why he is pumping an extra 75 billion pounds in into the economy. Uh, It's called quantitative easing, but basically it's printing money in order to get the economy moving and growing. Now, the flip side of that is that savers are stuck with miserable interest rates and, of course, prices going up. Um, And funny, I had a little example of this myself the other night. I was looking at my daughter's account. She got a wee bit of money from an elderly uncle that passed away when she was born. So we put it straight into an account for her. And I think it was £6,000 that was in there. And I was just looking back at it the other night. So this is over nine years and in the early days she was getting something like £800 interest a year which is pretty good and the last I checked it was £22 a year that's a massive difference, isn't it? When I mean, you think people have got their life savings in that, the difference in interest is phenomenal. So if that is the boat that you are in, give me a call, 0500 92 95 00, text 80295. I will refuse all calls from my daughter. Um, do you accept that this is a necessary measure, the quantitative easing? Uh, and if it means that your pensions and your savings are just bumping along the bottom, then so be it. Um, one man who doesn't think that we should be accepting it is Simon Rose from Save Our Savers. Uh, His group were standing outside the Bank of England yesterday with a a giant sacrificial savings pig called Bertie in protest. Good morning to you, Simon. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Explain to us just exactly what that protest was about, if you would. Well, the problem is, from our point of view, is that savers and pensioners and anybody on a fixed income who's been sort of cautious and prudent and tried putting by for a future like you and your daughter is essentially being sacrificed. Um, We've got inflation running massively ahead of low interest rates. Savers and pensioners are not the people who got us into this financial crisis. It's the people who borrowed imprudently. And yet we're in a situation where we're being asked to pay because what we've got at the moment is a situation where, um, in, in essence, your daughter's money and everybody else's who's saved is being taken from them and given to the borrowers because interest rates are so low. We just think that's an appalling situation. It's not only is it actually unfair to existing savers, but savings are vital to the economy. Um, Savers don't, by and large, put their money under the bed. They give it to the banks and the building societies who then go on to lend it to companies and to people and to fuel the economy. And when you're making the savings environment so difficult... Well, you know, and when you look at that statement of your daughters, you think, well, why bother saving? Well, if savings don't exist, then really the country is in 
an even deeper mess than Mervyn King would have us believe. I mean, I'm sure there's many, many people who are in a worse situation than, than my daughter's account. I mean, give us some sense of perspective here. How much are people leaving, losing out? And, and who are we talking about? Are they people that have got money to, to kind of not burn, but money to spare anyway? Uh, well, I mean, obviously some savers are, are you know, fairly wealthy. And the, the wealthier you are, probably the easier you find it, at least to try and mitigate the effects of inflation. But we're talking about pensioners, people on fixed income, even people just starting out in life who want to put money by or if you want to save for next year's holiday. There was a woman at the demonstration yesterday who, until her MP intervened, because she'd been a sort of married woman and because of the special, you know, circumstances prevailing in the days when, you know, it was the man expected to be a, 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 the breadwinner, she, when she retired, her pension was 22 pence a week until an MP intervened to help. It's not very good, but, you know, how do people cope? The, the people least able to cope, unfortunately, are the ones at the margins of society, the ones who are less well off. Um, but Simon, we, we know and, and we've been told by many different people and again yesterday by Mervyn King, the governor of the Bank of England, you know, we are in one unholy mess here. You know, the greatest financial crisis ever, uh, he's saying potentially. You know, yeah, time's tough for everyone. Are there any alternatives? Well, we think there are. We, we just do not believe that this business of having record low interest rates is working. It, we've had 0.5% base rate set by the Bank of England for nearly three years now. Have you seen it causing the economy to pick up? No, absolutely not. The problem is it's almost creating a dam across the economy and stopping it working. We've been hearing, I heard from the Chancellor on the Today programme this morning, one of the problems is that the banks won't lend to small and medium-sized businesses. Well, that's got nothing to do with the interest rate. Those companies would be quite happy to pay a decent interest rate, but they just can't get the loans. Well, at the same time, you know, if banks actually had rather more money because they're offering a decent rate to savers, then that would be a solution. We don't think low interest rates are right. We think there should be a more natural level, which will encourage savings and thus get money moving again through the economy. I, I was um, talking to a chap from one of the big building societies the other day and said, well, what's your view about interest rates? And he said, well, we want them higher because our margins would be better. We'd be that much better off. So it seems everybody except the Bank of England... <laughs> Well, not everybody, that's unfair, but most people would actually be much better off if interest rates were higher. And one other thing I must mention is that the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee has a legal remit, and that remit is to bring inflation down to the government's target. Well, the government's target is 2%. Inflation is over double that and due to head higher. So the Bank of England is actually not even doing what it is legally obliged okay. to do. Well, well, uh, Simon, I'm going to bring in Jonathan Davis because, as you say, there, there are different views on this one. Uh, Jonathan is an economist and wealth manager, uh, well known to us. Morning, Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. Are you with us? Uh, morning, Kay. Can you well, hear me? Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> are you well? I'm very well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the, now, we don't want to get too heavily into quantitative easing. We're really talking about the effect on savers this morning and, and whether or not they are indeed being um, taken to the cleaners. Um, but just quickly on the quantitative easing, basically printing money, is it the way forward? Uh, no, it's not. I'm dead against more printing money. All it does is import inflation. Um, it means that the cost of living rises for the man and woman in the street. Small businesses' uh, costs rise, which means unemployment rises. And for savers, yes, um, in due course, we're importing inflation. Savers are getting a very bad deal indeed. Uh, are they paying for the mistakes of other people? Oh, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the banks lent recklessly for years to households and to governments. The banks should be let go bust. And that way we would stop pumping money from savers and taxpayers into the bank. It's a great moment to leave it. Come back after the news. 92 to 95 FM, 810 medium wave and on digital. BBC Radio Scotland. The news at nine o'clock with Aileen Clark. The Scottish Government Minister tasked with guiding anti-sectarian legislation through Holyrood says the proposals are misunderstood. 
Rosanna Cunningham has been defending the bill as the First Minister, Alex Salmond, prepares to meet one of its most prominent critics. The Bishop of Paisley, Philip Tartaglia, says the focus on creating new offences could become a distraction. Ms Cunningham appeared on Good Morning Scotland earlier and was played examples of Rangers and Celtic fans singing particular songs. She was asked if, when the bill becomes law, the supporters involved could face prosecution. You know, there is little point playing clips in isolation when in actual fact the decisions are have to be made in context and the context is the facts and circumstances surrounding the incident itself and the likelihood of public disorder being created. The credit ratings agency Moody's has downgraded its debt ratings for a dozen British banks because of concern about the strength of government support. Those affected include the Royal Bank of Scotland and Lloyd's TSB, which are part state-owned, and Santander and Nationwide. It's 10 years to the day since the start of the American-led invasion of Afghanistan. During that time, more than 2,600 foreign troops have been killed, 382 of them British, and thousands of innocent Afghans. The former US Commander of International Forces, General Stanley McChrystal, says the military lacks the knowledge to bring the conflict to a successful end. Parents on low incomes who work fewer than 16 hours a week are to receive government help with the cost of childcare for the first time. From 2013, a family with one child will be able to claim up to £175 a week, rising to £300 when there are more children. Ministers say 80,000 families will benefit from the measure. The actress Diane Cilento has died at the age of 78 at home in Australia. She was once married to Sean Connery and appeared in dozens of films, television shows and stage productions. That's the news, now the sport with Jeff Webster. And we believe that Kenny Miller is likely to play in tomorrow night's Euro 2012 qualifier against Liechtenstein. He's been a doubt since picking up a groin injury at the weekend. Group winners Spain are away to the Czech Republic tonight. There was a hat-trick for Huddersfield Town striker Jordan Rhodes as the Scottish under-21s beat Luxembourg 5-1 in European Championship qualifying. And Glasgow City's women's football team will play the German club Potsdam in the last 16 of the Champions League after beating Valio Reykjavik 4-1 on aggregate. And at Golf's Madrid Masters, the Australian Brett Rumford has picked up a shot early this morning to lead on eight under par. Well, we'll have more on the Scotland game in an hour's time. That's a travel. Thanks, Jeff in Dundee. There's a new road layout on the A92 East Dock Street this morning. Now, it's causing a bit of confusion and a fair bit of congestion westbound. So that's heading for the Tay Road Bridge and Market Street. Just mind how you go here. Edinburgh Haymarket Terrace has ongoing roadworks causing citybound delays with further delays again citybound on nearby Dorai Road. That's heading up toward Haymarket. Falkirk, there's been an accident on Moss Road in Earth. Now, the road is partially blocked near Powside, so do be prepared for delays in both directions. And finally, in Little Annexure, the A 725 Bills Hill Road. That earlier broken down bus at the Wraith Interchange is now clear, but there are still 15 minute delays on all the approach roads to the roundabout. That's the Bells Hill Road to, um, heading towards East Kilbride Expressway and the southbound M74 heading for Junction 5 Wraith. And that's BBC Radio Scotland Travel. And let's take a look at Scotland's weather. Bright with just the odd shower for northern and western Scotland, the best of the sunshine in central, southern and eastern areas. Temperatures here will reach around 14 or 15 Celsius. Celsius, cooler further north at around 11 or 12 Celsius. That's BBC Radio Scotland News. 0500 92 00. Text 80295. You're listening to Call K on BBC Radio Scotland with me, Kay Adams, and I have a question for you. How do you like your eggs in the morning? I like mine with a kiss. Oh! oh. I'm satisfied. I love that song. I've got that on my iPod. How uncool am I? Very. Yes, OK, stop nodding now. Uh, I know it's a wee bit past breakfast time, but uh, you might have had a lovely egg this morning. Eggs are back in fashion, you know. For a wee while, they were verboten because of our cholesterol levels. But now, I think they're OK again, aren't they? We can welcome eggs back into the fold. Um, and with that in mind, a group of schoolgirls in Dorset carried out an experiment to find the perfect boiled egg. I really don't know why they bothered. They should just have called me, you know, because, I, I mean, I, I know. But anyway, this is what they say. They say get the water to boiling and then pop the eggs in 
for six minutes. Too long, I see. Six minutes. Here's my feel-safe way, OK? I get the, the water warm straight from the tap. I put the eggs in. I get it boiling. As soon as it boils, I put the toast on. And when I put the toast on and then when it pops, I take the eggs off the heat, but they're still in the warm water. And by the time I buttered the toast, I take them out. Perfect soft boiled egg. That's the way to do it, girls from Dorset. None of your six minutes rubbish. Um, if you've got a better way to boil the perfect boiled egg, you can text or email, but frankly, I doubt it. 80295 um, or you can email K at bbc.co.uk. Um, a wee bit later on, we're talking about dental charges. The Office of Fair Trading is launching an investigation into charges because it says Britain, in Britain, they're high and confusing. Well, if that's your experience, whether you're with an NHS dentist or a private dentist, uh, and if you are a private dentist, is it because you want to be or because you couldn't find an NHS one? Uh, 0592 00. Just catching up in the snow, we have a course had the first snow. Donald in Perth was walking in Glen Elg two weeks ago and got a wee bit sleet and snow, approximately just as Dan Parks missed that last minute drop go. Oh dear, wasn't a good moment. Uh, Susan in Sunny Leith says, have seen the white stuff in June and July. Is that early or late? Discuss. Well, I think we're going to say that late actually, Susan, but thank you for that. Um, yes, I have also seen it in June. I don't know if I've seen it in July, but what is the earliest you have seen snow in Scotland? and I'm still waiting to hear somebody's boots crunching on snow that is currently there, just so that we know the papers are telling us the truth. Thank you very much. Um, right, let's get back to the plight of savers. The Governor of the Bank of England is pumping £75 billion into the economy to try to get things going. The flip side, of course, is that savers are having to tolerate miserly interest rates. Simon Rose of Save Our Savers says savers are getting a very raw deal and they need to start shouting about it. Uh, so if you'd like to shout about it, shout at me, 0500 92 95 00. Have your savings been devastated and are you angry about it or do you just accept it? Also been speaking to Jonathan Davis uh, who's an economist and wealth manager who says there is another way, just let the banks go bust. We'll discuss that in just a second. Uh, but Simon, Simon Rose, if I can uh, just put a couple of our texts to you here. Um, people not particularly sympathetic uh, with savers actually saying Andrew from Shetland here saying no point in saving uh, uh, paltry interest rates on savings and high interest on loans, win-win for the banks and shareholders, lose-lose for ordinary people, banks win again. Banks have to go to the wall. Well, actually, that's taking up your point, Jonathan. Here's the one. Noreen Stevenson. Savers need to be assured that their money is safe, first and foremost. Forget interest rates. We are now hearing that the government may now not guarantee savings in certain foreign banks based here in Scotland. And Scott and Carl Luke says, total nonsense. People are only managing to make ends meet due to low mortgage rates. God knows I wish I had savings to fall back on. Taking Scott's point, more um, interest rates are low means mortgage payments are low. For Scott and Carluke and other people, that means that he's getting by. So maybe, you know, savers need to take a back seat. Well, obviously, there are two sides to everything. Um, I mean, mortgage rates are not staggeringly low. Many people have taken, took out mortgages when interest rates were rather higher. Um, but the problem is that we are an incredibly indebted country. Um, and in the long term, that's going to spell absolute disaster. You know, we look at pictures from Greece and we think, oh, you know, it's a world away. But of the countries in the G7, guess which country's got the most debt per head of population? It's Britain and the least savings. And if you look at the country as a whole and you look ahead a long time, which I don't think the Bank of England is doing, we have as a nation to have savings because otherwise, with a rising um, and ageing population, we simply are not going to be able to afford to look after people. Uh, you know, and whether people have savings personally or whether the government uses its money, uh, there are going to be an awful lot of people who are going to need looking after in the next generation. Well, well Jonathan, do, do you agree with that? Because, I mean, the other thing that we've been hearing this week is about growth, is about need to grow this economy and we're not able to pay down debts unless we have, you know, a, a buoyant economy. So there's a contradiction there, isn't there? Um, there's no contradiction whatsoever because um, we are an economy with £7,000 billion of debt. £7 trillion. My point is, and one of these days the media and the politicians are going to get this straight, you cannot have growth when you have an economy with £7 trillion 
of debt. We have to, therefore, change our priorities. Um, the other gentleman is absolutely correct. We need to focus on savings and investments rather than continually bailing out the banks. We are just handing the money over fist. And one final point. You keep saying that the Bank of England has printed money to help the economy. No, they haven't. That's the line that they're spinning, and that's the line that the BBC is taking. They are printing money to yet again bail out the banks it does not help the man and woman on the street okay well let's bring in brian johnson uh, who's the divisional director of brew and dolphin investment management good morning to you brian good morning uh, you heard what jonathan says here this is not about getting the economy moving it's about once again bailing out the banks we should let the banks go bust and we should be looking after the man in the street and savers well, it's a question of how you define a bank going bust. I mean, many, many of the UK banks are already effectively owned by the government, and by the government I mean us, so t the UK taxpayer. So pumping money into the banks is not necessarily using, being used to shore up the bank's uh, balance sheets, but hopefully it's to get money into the economy to generate spending. And that is the critical point. What we have here is a, an atrophied economy with companies re uh, retaining their cash, not embarking on capital investment programs, and uh, savers, if there aren't any, not having any return on savings, and spenders being very uh, jealous of the, of the household budget contained. So it's a, it's a major problem. So the quantitative easing problem, uh, no, solution, as uh, the Bank of England would have it, you would support? I think we have little option. It's not, I quite agree with previous comments. It's not an attractive proposition. It almost certainly will fuel the inflationary uh, spiral. But that, that, that said, large amounts of debt benefit, if you like, um, from rising inflation by inflating it away. But we haven't got much option. We, we, should, we shouldn't be in this mess. But as we are in this mess, the best way of getting out of it is to try to generate economic activity. And that means lubricating the economy. And that is what the bank is trying to do. And more importantly, if I may say, it's not so much what they're doing. It's what they seem to be doing. It's psychological. This a boost. If to confidence. There is precious little confidence in, frankly, in the bankers and in our politicians. And we need to see decisive action. Okay. And that is what we're seeing. Uh, yeah, go on, Jonathan. Um, as, as he quite rightly says, more money printing fuels inflation. And what he quite incorrectly says is that they're trying to inflate the debt away. Well, that doesn't help the man and woman in the street or the economy, because what it does is inflation raises the cost of living and it raises the costs of running businesses. Therefore, as society spends less and businesses employ less, all it does is help the politicians and the bankers. It doesn't help the real economy. Okay. Can I, can I chip in? It's uh, Simon Racey from Save Our Savers. I just went into the Bank of England Museum yesterday when we were having our dem demonstration to, to pick up a, a leaflet on um, quantitative easing to see how they explain it. And in their booklet it says, low and stable inflation is crucial to a thriving and prosperous economy. The Bank of England aims to keep inflation at the 2% target set by the government. You talked about increasing confidence among politicians and bankers, but that's not the problem. Two-thirds of our economy, uh, of GDP, comes from the man and the woman in the street. Now, do they have confidence? Is what the Bank of England doing going to inspire them with confidence? Nonsense. After what the Governor of the Bank of England said yesterday, they are going to be terrified. Well, I mean, you have mentioned, and Jonathan has mentioned, the man and woman in the street. And it's a man and woman in the street that I want to hear from this morning in terms of how they feel about this. I mean, are you more confident because of the Bank of England's uh, move to put more money into uh, the economy or not? And, you know, we are also talking about savers. So let me know if your savings have taken a kicking. Well, they have, because everybody's have. Uh, and how you feel about it. Do you accept that or not? 0500 92 95 00 is the number to call. Um, Jonathan, so if we continue, and we've got different views here, and obviously I want to hear from Brian as well, but in your view, Jonathan, and let's focus on the man and woman on the street, given uh, the move that the Bank of England has just taken, what does it mean for us? Yeah, it doesn't mean um, anything uh, significant at all. Two years ago, those who say they saved the world, what they did was borrow £200 billion and give it to the banks. And they also took on hundreds of billions of bank guarantees. They saved the world. Absolute, utter nonsense. What they did was compound the problem. Um, in order to get some growth in the last couple of years, they did that. 
They slashed interest rates from 5% to 0.5%, and they also boosted the public sector. What have they done yesterday? They said they're going to print $75 billion. In other words, one-third of what they did two years ago. They're not affecting uh, interest rates, and indeed they're slightly cutting public sector. In other words, the net benefit to the person in the street is nil. But not negative. Um, well, it will be negative in due course because by... I mean, I'm asking you to get the crystal ball out here, Jonathan. You know, what's going to what's gonna happen to people who've got a wee bit put away in, yeah. the, in the, the bank? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, their savings are going to be dwindled by inflation, not necessarily over the next few months, but over the medium to long term, they're going to find that their savings fall to practically nothing because they're decimating the currency. What they should be doing is hiking interest rates and boosting the currency. That then will help savers and it will cut the costs of living. Right, OK. We've got Margaret in Dunfermline. Good morning, Margaret. Oh, good morning, Keith. How are you doing this morning? I'm fine, thank you. And yourself? I'm fine. I'm holding on to this discussion by the skin of my teeth, to be honest, because it's pretty complicated. But what we want to know is how people feel about it when you know, you're looking at a normal household budget. How are you feeling about it? I think it's a disgrace, actually, because we have got money in two or three banks and the interest we are getting is absolutely nothing. We put money away in one account for five years and didn't get a penny back. So they used their money. We didn't get a penny back. To me, that's a form of stealing. Well, I mean, absolutely. And I mean, you, what, what, what could you have done with that money otherwise? Uh, well, I don't know. I don't put know. In new, put in a new kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, enjoy it. Maybe that's what you should yes. have done. Yes, but we saved for a rainy day. And they're using our money, as I said, and we're not getting anything back, which is, isn't right. Exactly. Si Simon Rose, that's exactly... Margaret's given us a perfect example exactly, of, yeah. of the people that you're concerned about. Yeah, no, absolutely. And w what really concerns me is, you know, we've, we've got members, um, you know... I mean, Save Our Savers is open to anybody, so do please, you know, come to the website and have a look and, 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 you know, carry on the discussion. But, you know, I remember one email from a guy saying that, you know, his savings, he'd got some sort of fixed interest savings, they'd all dropped out, he was handicapped, he'd got kids, he had got a house, but he didn't know how he was going to manage, and he felt he was just going to sell up everything, spend the money, and live off the state. Well, you know, if this environment continues for much longer, then the savers we've got are just going to throw up their hands and say, OK, look, I've done the right thing. You know, politicians keep telling us uh, that we're supposed to save. Osborne and Cameron only a couple of years ago were saying Labour are being unfair to savers. We're going to help savers. You know, we're, you know, we believe savers are essential to a strong economy. <laughs> what happens when they're in power? Well, they just forget us. They throw us to the wind. And it, it's really worrying. But I do wonder if there may be an alternative. I mean, this is completely pie in the sky stuff. But we keep being told that small and medium sized businesses are desperate to borrow money. Well, we've got all these savers who are desperate to lend money at a better rate than they're getting. Why can we not be bringing these two sides together? Because the one thing we get more than anything else is I hate the banks. The banks are cheating us. The banks are unfair. The banks have put me in a low interest account. They didn't tell me. Can we not bring savers and the people who need to borrow together in some form of social lending? I mean, this does exist, but it's not, not very much social lending is for companies. And then just bypass the banks altogether. If the banks don't actually do what they're supposed to do and stand up and be counted when it matters, then let's just forget them and do it ourselves and go back to a different system where you can see the person you're lending money to and it's not some anonymous computer programme standing in the middle. Well, cut the, cut the banks out. Well, that's what, what do you think of that? Oh, 500, 92, 95, double O. And are you in the same boat as Margaret, who has uh, very eloquently uh, summed up the situation that we're talking about this morning, putting money away, trying to put a bit away for a rainy day in three different accounts, spreading your bets, if you like, and at the end of it gets absolutely nothing. What can be done? Can you do anything about that? Jonathan, what would you say to the Margarets of this world? What can you do? Um, well, first of all, you, you stop listening to people from the city who want people to believe that what's good for the city is good for the country. When the city is making money, there's no doubt that um, their staff, their extremely well-paid staff, pay taxes and whatever, 
but it's all based on illusory finance. In other words, it all eventually goes to losses. And who takes the losses? The taxpayer. In other words, eventually the city costs us rather than benefits us. What we need to do is move away from a city-based economy to a manufacturing economy. I refer you to Germany and China for simple examples. We need to hike interest rates now and we need to stop bailing out the banks. OK, I'm going to come to Brian Johnson in just a second, but let's just see what um, uh, the techs are saying. We've got lots of texts in on this. Here we go. Uh, Jim says, I hear the economies of Sweden, Denmark and Norway are all very healthy. Any brain, brain boxes know how they do it? Maybe we could copy them. Uh, Lewis says, letting the banks go bust is a potential disaster. If my bank goes bust, i.e. into administration, the creditors will simply claim all the debt back, as would be their right. My mortgage is my only debt. My savings wouldn't cover anything like that at all. I'm a man on the street and the thought of that happening to my young family is terrifying. Um, Brian Johnson, you're a city boy. Are you just lining your pockets at the expense of the man in the street? Oh, absolutely. I'm just a parasite on society. Um, but the real, I mean, the issue here is you look at any, any management of an economy, it falls into two categories. One is monetary, that is interest rates, and the other is fiscal, that is tax. I think it's quite interesting that the Bank of England moved yesterday, a month ahead of George Osborne's autumn financial review. We need some move on fiscal benefit, that is reducing taxation. Over the, over the period of the Labour government, national insurance contributions went up by something like 15%. That's a direct tax on incomes and more importantly on tax on jobs. I'm hoping that this government will parallel the moves on quantitative easing by reducing the, ta- the tax burden on individuals so there will be more money in circulation. You cannot run an economy with one lever alone, which is interest rates. You must use both, which is fiscal. Apart from anything else, monetary policy takes a long time to work, as indeed the fiscal policy. We're looking at long-term propositions here. You won't be able to, ban- by the way, um, abolishing the banks. The banks are always there to lend money to people. The first proposition is to get money into the banks in the first instance. With interest rates where they are at the moment, they can't attract funds. I've been arguing for the last two years interest rates should go up. I think it's too late now because I think the psychological damage of increasing interest rates would be a mistake. But interest rates will go up, and they will go up quite quickly over the next 12 to 18 months, in my opinion, when things settle down. OK, well, that's interesting. Jo- Jonathan Davis and yourself, Brian, saying that interest rates should be going up, yep. but probably coming at it from different uh, sides. Um, let's speak to Anne Hill. Good morning, Anne. Morning, Kay. Good morning. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Good. You're a saver. Are you a happy saver? No, I'm not a happy saver. I mean, it's, it's, it's hardly worth saving anymore because, I mean, you, you work hard, you put your money in the bank and you look at it and think, OK, I might be able to leave that there for maybe two or three, five years. And you think, what am I going to get out at the end of it? Mm. The same. And you know, I... it's just not going to be worth your while. I mean, unless you want to just let your money lie there and stagnate, um, there's no incentive for anybody to really save. And the only way really to... Well, I wouldn't say the only way, but... On advice, we thought, right, what can we do if, if, we've, if we've got some spare money? Um, and the advice you get is, well, you should be investing it in property. Uh-huh. And you think, OK, I'll invest it in property, but if I'm going to invest it in, in property, I'm going to have to take out another mortgage. Yeah. So it's going to cost me anyway. Well, so there's it... just no incentive there. And not only that, if they do put interest rates up, looking at it for the other end, because my children all have mortgages going to cripple them. Mm-hmm. So what's the best case scenario for you then, Anne? Spend it. <laughs> <laughs> Spend it and enjoy it. <laughs> well, you know... Give it to me kids to help them out. Um, and then hope that... Um, I mean, one, I always thought that one of the worst things they ever did, and I have really no huge opinion on money matters or how to work the country financially, but I think one of the worst things I found was the 20% VAT. Right. From and what? all the kids have said the same. Everything's costing more. So do you so really cost- feel that, that, Anne? You're very much aware of things costing more. Very much so. Mm-hmm. Very much so. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a quilter. I quilt. Um, and fabric and stuff cost you an arm and a leg. And that's something that you do for, for, for not just for pleasure, because, I mean, Alzheimer's Project, I do it, you know, business-wise as well. Uh-huh. But at the same time, it's, it's 20% on just about everything you buy. Um and the cost of living for kids and for, for parents who want to try and entertain their kids. You go on holiday, if you can afford to go on holiday. There's no incentive mm. to save mm. anymore. So no. I think I'm probably more inclined to say, OK, if I can't enjoy this money in the future, yes, I can enjoy it. But at least let me try and help the kids out. 
Yeah, and I think you're in a very similar situation to, to lots of people, but yes. uh, your your answer, well, to help out your children, but also maybe spend it, and maybe that's what we should be doing, Jonathan Davis, because, you know, that might get the economy going, that we should be spending stuff rather than paying down the whole time. What's the point of, of saving? We need consumers to buy, don't we? That, that, that's what those who pretend that they can plan the economy would want people to do, the politicians in the Bank of England. The first thing is they cannot plan the economy. There are a trillion decisions being made every single day. No, uh, p uh, individual people are not going to be bailed out by governments. Only banks will be bailed out. So thus we have to um, put our um, grey cells together uh, and we have to save and invest in a way that will combat inflation. Um, they, they are printing money until the cows come home, which means that it's likely that by the end of the decade, we're going to have 1970s style inflation. Let me remind your listeners that in the 1970s, we had 25% inflation. And if they carry on printing money like this, we're all going to be hammered. So but what Jonathan, do we have to do? as you say, planning is very, very difficult from uh, you know, the, the very top level. But I mean, from from our level, from down it's, here, it's not, what, what do we difficult. do? It's not difficult. What we do is we invest in those areas which are going to keep up with inflation uh, in the medium to long run, such as agricultural produce and precious metals such as gold and silver. If you just blithely put it into the stock market, well, you're going to be a loser. The stock market is there to take money off you. If, however, with professional wealth management, you get it in the right areas, then you can keep up with inflation. Right. OK, well, we want some more advice like that for people who do have a wee bit of extra money, what they can be doing with it. And uh, let me know what you are doing with it. Are you still saving and just hoping that it's all going to come up at some stage or are you just deciding to spend it or have you diversified into something else uh, 0500 92 95 00 we've got an accountant who has uh, texted in John from Milne Craig uh, it has always been thus Kate to achieve medium to long term inflation beating returns keeping cash on deposit is not the answer money should be invested and diversified to obtain a better return this does not necessarily mean taking a high level of risk uh, that's kind of what you're saying Jonathan Dave in Aberdeen uh, the be a snag, but couldn't the IMF gather all the money owned by the governments of the world together and redistribute it to every country on a population basis? I think that's what you call radical, Dave. Um, let's uh, let's speak to Hazel in Aberdeen. Hi, Hazel. Hi, Kay. How are you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you. Um, are you well, you've got to be a saver from Aberdeen, haven't you, Hazel? <laughs> <laughs> we have that reputation. Being and it's careful. a good one. It's but, a good uh, one, Hazel. I've been quite worried about the fact that, you know, savings are just achieving nothing. And I was looking at an alternative solution, which uh, is possibly going to uh, generate about 8% return. Mm -hmm. What's that? Well, uh, if you've got a suitable south-facing roof on your house or a suitable outbuilding, solar panels are the answer. Right. Now, um, we've explored these before. That's interesting. Well, oh. um, obviously, uh, there's a very generous tariff at the moment for um, called a feed-in tariff, when you generate electricity from your solar panels, your photovoltaic panels. And not only are you getting a good return for your capital invested in this way, but you're also future-proofing yourself against increased energy costs, domestic energy costs. So have you made that investment I then, am, Hazel? I am actively exploring this possibility at the moment. Right. Now, if you haven't got a suitable roof... Um, I would like to suggest that, that we ought to be able to invest in community-owned renewable energy projects, as they do in Scandinavia. Uh, it's already been mentioned about good practice on the other side of the North Sea. People in Denmark, for example, seem to be willing to do this, putting money into community-owned projects. So it's a win-win situation because it's obviously going to generate economic activity, the sad thing is, from our point of view, that these nicely um, high-efficient uh, uh, solar panels are made in Germany rather than being made in Scotland, which is a real shame, but that's the only snag that I can see at the moment. Right. But, okay. um, yeah, can who... I just add to 
list. Yeah, go on. I think the lady has hit on absolutely superb ideas there for individuals or local communities to be able to protect themselves as to what the government is doing against us. And I just might make the incidental point that uh, inflation is deliberate. It is not happenstance. Um, the, the problem, however, with the likes of the solar planner, uh, uh, panel scheme is, although it, it is in effect um, a government uh, scheme, therefore there, uh, there are benefits, uh, no doubt, as she talks about 8% per annum return, a very good return, those benefits, those uh, schemes can be taken away at any point. So people shouldn't assume they'll always be there. No, they can't. But I do believe, Hazel, and you might be able to tell me, that there is some kind of, if you sign up in a, in a certain time frame, yeah, you sign that, up there's now, a kind of guarantee, fixed, isn't there? No, it's fixed. You've got a 25-year sort yeah. of plan. So I think that's a pretty good um, base or, or uh, proofing yourself against inflation, certainly on, on domestic energy, because obviously <laughs> you're actually using some, using some of that power yourself mm -hmm. in, in the house. I mean, it's not all going to be exported. You're going to t get the benefit directly on a, a day-to-day -day basis in the fuel that you're mm. using in your well, own Well, I mean, given that everything really has been exposed as a bit of a gamble, I suppose as gambles go, that's sounding like a, a pretty reasonable one. Hazel, thank you. That's a good suggestion into the mix here because let's concentrate on this. What we can do, Mervyn King, uh, uh, the Governor of the Bank of England and his quantitative easing, there's not a lot we can do to affect that. Decisions like that are taken. But if you are somebody who is a saver, who wants to be uh, if not a saver, just to be prudent, what can you do? What are you doing with your money? Are you still saving or are you taking alternative routes? We had Anne there who's decided that she's going to spend it and enjoy it. Um, and then another suggestion from Hazel that uh, to put it into renewable energy. What are you doing? 0500 92 95 00 is the number to call. What's happening on the travel, Teresa? <laughs> Thanks, Kay. The high wind warning remains on the Sky Bridge. Now, in Dundee, there's a new road layout this morning on the A92 East Dock Street. It's causing a fair bit of confusion and congestion westbound. So westbound is heading for the Tay Road Bridge and also Market Street. Just mind how you go here. Edinburgh Haymarket Terrace is ongoing roadworks causing citybound delays with further delays against citybound on nearby Dorai Road. That's heading up to Haymarket. On the M9 Stirling Edinburgh Road, please tell me there's an HGV tyre. Um, it's lying on the road near Junction 5 Hadgersbury. I think it's actually in bits. I think it came off the, the, the lorry. So it's causing problems. Edinburgh bound cars are having to swerve to avoid that, but police are on the case. Falkirk, that earlier accident on Moss Road and Ayr, that's now clear. In North Lanarkshire on the A89 Calder Crooks to Plains Road, there are roadworks causing delays at the three way temporary traffic lights just near Plains. And in South Lanarkshire, that earlier broken down bus I was telling you about at the Wraith Interchange, that's now clear. So any lingering delays heading for Wraith should ease very shortly. And finally in the borders, the A7 north of Gala Shields is closed at Stow until 5 o'clock today for essential repairs. And that's BBC Radio Scotland Travel. Thank you very much, uh, Teresa. You're listening to Call Kay on BBC Radio Scotland with me, Kay Adams. I've got some suggestions for the perfect boiled egg. Um, this one, Kay, put the eggs into cold water. That's in capital letters, so that's obviously very important. Cold water, bring to the boil, take off the heat and leave it to stand in the hot water for five minutes. Do your toast as the egg sit. Perfect. That's an anonymous one there. It's obviously a state secret. Jim in Netherly. Oh, Jim, really. You know, you have some corkers, but this, this ranks really, I don't know where. I tried to have two boiled eggs in Paris, but they told me one egg was enough. Do you get it? See? Jim's a very cultured fellow. Enough. Um, we're talking about dentists. Have I said we're talking about dentists? No, I haven't. That's what we're talking about very soon. Um, whether or not you're sick to the back teeth of dental charges. The cost of treatment in Britain has been condemned for being expensive and confusing. Uh, so much so the Office of Free Trading is going to launch an inquiry into how clear and fair dentist charges are. Um, so tell me how you find it. Uh, do you find them fairly straightforward or are you confused by them? Uh, this goes across NHS and private. Uh, if you have got a private dentist, is it because you want one or is it because you couldn't find an NHS one? And of course the, the underlying worry here is that people will be actually put off from going to the dentist because of charges. Uh, so if uh, that's applied to you, then give us a call 0500 92 95 00. You can text 80295. There was a story last week, of course, that children would no longer be able to get corrective work on the NHS to get their tram tracks um, unless it was affecting their health. If you've been caught out by that one, you can let me know on that too. 
Mike's a dentist. He says we have to give a verbal and fully itemised written estimate at the checkup visit. Uh, the NHS also fixes the prices. Uh, that's interesting. Does everyone get that? A verbal and fully itemised uh, written estimate. Um, George in Bonnybridge says it's well known that to get on an NHS dentist list is difficult. So if your NHS dentist says your needs are more than what the NHS can cover, then if you can afford it, you would normally just give them the go ahead because of the uncertainties of trying to get another dentist to do it. A solution would be to require dentists following a checkup to write a prescription like opticians do so you can shop around. I think you have spotted the little cavity there, George. Well done. Philip says, my NHS practice in Kerstorf in Edinburgh provides a full detail of the cost of treatment, which is very reasonable and guaranteed for a year. Um, OK, well, two NHS dentists saying that they give full itemised estimates. Uh, I'd like to know from other people with NHS dentists if that is absolutely standard practice. Um, let's get back to the subject of saving. Have you got any savings? What are you doing with them? Uh, have you just given up the ghost and decided it's not worth it? Are you spending them? Are you doing something else? Any bright ideas? Very welcome. Let's speak to Mark in Edinburgh and then Billy in Glasgow. Sorry, I'm, I'm losing the I ghost can... here. Mark. Hi, Mark. You I talk can... so I can get a wee sip of tea here. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I work for one of the, the major high street banks and uh, this uh, quantitative easing uh, is a bit of a myth in that to help the re- real economy. One of your callers was quite correct earlier saying that it's actually to help the banks uh, get some toxic assets off their books. What they do is they take financial products that they have created uh, and they package them up and they call that securitization. They, set, they then sell these securities on the market uh, at uh, whatever price they think they're worth uh, and then when they realise that they're not worth what they think they're worth, uh, they have these securities off balance sheet so we never know how much the banks have actually got off balance sheet and then when they do the quantitative easing, the, the banks come along and trade these uh, toxic assets for a real uh, 100% of the value that they thought that they should be worth when they're actually worth nothing. In fact, some of them are even a fraud. Uh, if you look at uh, Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert on Channel 85 uh, Freeview, they will give you, they tell you the, the way the world is uh, in the real economy and how the banks actually... Uh, use these securitised uh, uh-huh. And you're saying packages. this as somebody who works for a bank, Mark? Yes. So what do you think about that? Uh, I don't think it's uh, um, something that uh, is, is, is very uh, acceptable in, in modern society, but I don't see how uh, any other way we can uh, get around it. At, at the moment, the banks rule the world. Goldman Sachs rules the world. Uh, we think our politicians rule the world. There was a guy on BBC News and ITV the other week, and he said uh, exactly the same. Uh, Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan Chase rule the world. Mark, I'm just going to bring in Brian Johnson again from Bruin Dolphin Investment Management. Um, is that the way you see it, Brian? Are we just all being tied up like kippers here? Well, I think we're all getting pretty cynical. There was no question that there was a gross excess in, the, in what people call the banking system. I don't believe there were bankers. I mean, bankers were people who took money off people and put it on deposit and lent it out to others on having interrogated the risk. And we lost the definition of interrogating risk. We need to get that back again. I think the most important thing people facing problems now is to take advice, take independent advice. There are vehicles out there where you can generate income uh, with varying degrees of risk profile, ranging from index-linked government bonds, for example, which protect you against inflation. And the inflation addition you get is actually tax-free. So you can actually get an overall return of 4 or 5%. And there are also quality equities out there which yield quite attractive returns. But these are not appropriate for everybody. So it's essential you take advice. Yeah, but, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are just putting a wee bit of away. You know, and, OK, it's a very complicated market and you can investigate this investment and the next investment. I'm sitting looking at a text here from Andy and Air. I'm terrified that my 90-year-old mother can now only afford five years in her present care home due to falling interest rates on the capital she got when she sold her house, then what? I mean, when we're talking about people in these situations, you know, who just always thought, and with very good valid reason, that you go along to your bank or your building society, you put in your money, it's safe and it'll grow. These people are being shafted, are they not? Well, I think that's another... Which I mean, a purely personal view, I, I think the tragedy we have is that interest rates were held down for too long at too low over the last decade. They should have res- reflected inflationary pressures at the time, and I would like to see them up again. We can explain why it happened, but that's the reality, isn't it, though? Yeah, that's it the is. elephant in the room, Kate, is the, uh, the house prices uh, going forward, because the government and uh, uh, the country need the house prices to be so high so that when uh, we, uh, we reach our, pens- our 
retirement age or the time when we need the care, we need to be able to sell these houses to pay for our own care. Now, if house prices were to drop so far that we couldn't pay for our own care and the government had to pay for the care at the moment, they only pay for 20,000 care at the moment. Uh, if that was to go up, to 80,000 or 100,000 people that they had to pay the full care for at the, because house prices had fallen so much we couldn't pay our own care. The government would be bankrupt just on that one issue. Well, listen, Mark, don't get Jonathan started on the property uh, market or we'll all be reaching for the whiskey. I can tell you that. Let's bring in Billy in Glasgow. Good morning, Billy. Hi, Billy. Oh, I think Billy's walking along the street, is he? Yes, yes, he is. Um, well, Jonathan, that means I'm going to have to let you talk about the property market then. I'm not looking forward to I, this. I, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but basically uh, I, a lady earlier said maybe we should invest in property. No, that's the last thing you should do. It worked for the last 30 or 40 years. It's not going to work going forward because interest rates cannot go down. The public sector is not going to go up. Lending is not going to go up. Everything that created the virtuous spiral in house prices has reversed. Look, um, we should be splitting the high street banks from the investment banks. Um, the caller from the bank is so spot on, and I congratulate him for telling the truth. You go to your bank and put a £1,000 of savings in there. First of all, you get practically no interest. Okay, you can get 2 or 3% if you shop around, which isn't terrible, although it's below inflation. But you put it in the bank, it's immediately in the global casino. We need to also split high street banks from investment banks. That way, your brew and dolphin guy, we can get back to um, lending and deposit taking just like it was in the old days. And that's the way we will get back to growing the economy. Mark, can I ask you, what do you do with your savings? Um, I, well, I've got some savings in the bank, uh, some shares, uh, which I don't want very much anymore. Uh, and uh, I try to spend as much as, of my money as I can on what just, I mean, at the moment, we're just working to pay our bills, really, at the end of the day. I mean, the government are saying that austerity measures haven't hit. Well, they have, because we've got so much inflation and no many, no wage rises. Petrol, house, uh, house prices have dropped, fuel prices have gone up. We're already in austerity in the real economy, and none of the austerity, uh, austerity measures have actually been implemented yet. So we've got it all to come. Uh, there's a perfect storm around the corner. Uh, and uh, at the moment, it's not looking uh, very good. Wow. It's, uh, Brian Johnson, are you as pessimistic? I think that we are facing a, a certain amount of uncertainty, shall we say. But no, I'm intrinsically an optimist on the basis that we now live in a global mixed economy. The energies of the emerging economies of India and China and the Middle East, Far East, Latin America, whatever, will underwrite global growth. What I do think will happen is this will be at the progressive proprietorial and economic and political authority of the West, and we have to acknowledge that. Our, our day is done from that point of view, and largely by our, by our own devices. We, have, we are the architects of our own demise, but I wouldn't get too depressing. We've muddled through, and we'll muddle through again, but there will be an element of smoke and mirrors coming along, and it, it's need to take advantage of those smoke and mirrors, look through the smoke and look at the mirror. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's, it sounds very good and very smooth, Brian, but I have to say there's a lot of people there who out there who don't necessarily want to or aren't necessarily able to, you know, dodge the smoke and mirrors and, and just thought that they were doing the right thing by putting their money in the bank and clearly um, that there's not a lot of good news on the horizon no, and for they, them. They, and, and I think they have been betrayed frankly. I think people who have been prudent and diligent put money in the bank have been badly let down and that's why I've been arguing for some time as I say the interest rates should have gone up but they haven't. Right. Um, and it's a, it's a singular unfortunate. But rest assured rates, interest rates will go up over the next year or so so from that point of view I offer that comfort but not immediately. Okay, Brian Johnson um, from uh, Bruin Dolphin Investment Management thank you very much. Uh, Jonathan Davis, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure we'll speak to you again. Thank you, Jonathan. And Nancy in Edinburgh says, why aren't we encouraged to buy premium bonds? Because that doesn't help the banks. Why do we have the highest debt in Europe? Because we're encouraged to take out mortgages instead of renting. Um, this one here, who is it from? Les and Livingston. Stop paying people's wages into the banks and make them tout for our money. Uh, cut the 90% tax on fuel and food prices will come down and the man and woman on the street will have money in their pockets. Cameron and Clegg are on 12 grand a month should be made to take a hit for ineptitude. Uh, Jim and Fort William pull out of Afghanistan would save the economy millions every day. Um, I think, to be honest, we're all kind of scrabbling around here. No disrespect to those texters. I put myself exactly in that same uh, boat. And when you hear the people who are supposed to know what is happening, 
I can't say it exactly fills you with confidence, does it? Uh, oh, I need cheered up. I need cheered up.